Well, I want to thank Pierre Emmanuel for um, inviting me to do this. I always love to do things like this because I say I, I give him a title and then I say I wonder what I really think about that. Uh, so that's uh, in fact what I'm doing today. Um, I thought more of you might be lawyers. How many of you are lawyers? Oh, good. Oh, good. I was, I was afraid you said we had all these other people who weren't lawyers. I thought, oh no, and I was doing there were a lot of lawyers. Can you hear me? Um, so, um, I wanted to think about the relationship of law and uh, innovation. And I wanted to think about it particularly because I was set off by the, by the material that got sent to me. Which, uh, I'll show you in a minute what I was objecting to, but I noticed the social constructs, quote unquote, of um, the uh, technology and society relationship. And I kept thinking, but Where's the corporation in all this? Because that's not a social construct. That's a legal construct. And it has a lot to do with what happens in the choices that are made around technologies. Technologies don't develop in a, vac in a vacuum, and they don't develop in industries. They develop in companies or by individual inventors. Well, you, you all know this, and many of you. How many of you are entrepreneurs? <laughs> well, scarcity, I have to. I don't know. I, had a I just went to my my company's 34th anniversary retreat over the weekend, so I'm thinking about it a lot. Okay, so the agenda here today, and I, what I'm going to try to do here, because I've done way too much, because I think I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, I'm going to summarize what I say up here, and anybody who's interested in knowing more, I'm happy to share with you. But I'm going to start with the strange case of GMOs as a technology, which obviously is out there now, quite controversial in some ways. I don't know how many of you saw the New York Times article I'm going to refer to in a minute over the weekend, but it's caused all kinds of flat. A strange case of GMOs, which is a current technology under development and also in use, has been for 20 years, but which is coming out in a rather strange way. But, but I, I didn't have an inside track on that, so I'm just going to speculate on what has caused some of the developments that happened in GMOs very briefly. I'm going to talk about what I call some weird simplifying assumptions from a non-lawyer's perspective. Because I think, I'm, I'm sure it's not because people actually believe these things, but they tend to assume them. Now, the one I don't have up here is that innovation is always good. We all know that's not true. I mean, I, if, we, if I took a poll right now, I bet people would say anything from 30 to 40% of innovations are actually awful, maybe more than that. So innovation is obviously not all good, and yet policy seems to assume that they are. Um, I want to think about where um, a few 20th century examples where I really was on the inside, at least at some point during a 20-year period when I was both in academia and doing a lot of field work in companies. Uh, and I'm going back and visiting those now 20 years later. Um, and I want to think about where the legal system and the lawyers are in these stories. Because the legal system and the lawyers aren't necessarily the same thing. Okay? So the legal system is the, um, the incentives on the one hand and the regulation on the other hand that I think uh, our speaker talked about earlier. That's certainly very important. It provides the legal framework. But, but where are the lawyers, right? And what kind of advice are they giving? And what role are they playing? And then I'm going to come back briefly to GMOs if I have time and talk about what this, this uh, radical transactionalism of free trade, I read that, that term in The Economist last week, and I said radical transactionalism. Well, let's take a look at that. Okay, so some weird assumptions. The assumptions I object to is that law has a direct shaping effect on technology. It's actually more indirect, it seems to me. Incentives and regulations have a predictable and measurable effect on industries, well, very rarely. The industry is the meaningful unit of analysis. Industries don't make decisions. All companies in an industry respond to incentives and regulations the same way. Not, not in my experience. Yes, technology and society are social constructs, but the corporation is the legal entity. And corporations make strategic choices within a regulatory framework advised by lawyers. Now, this is the, the picture that came in the article in the New York Times. Doubts about the promised bounty of GMO after 20 years of use of GMOs. And the interesting thing is that in this New York Times report, 
just published October 30th, that was just on Sunday, they talk about the promise, the fix for global food insecurity while reducing the use of pesticides, herbicides, and increasing yields. And then they go on to compare GMOs in North America versus conventional agriculture in Europe and especially in France. And they point out that in fact the yields are roughly the same, but that the use of toxic herbicides and pesticides has gone down considerably more in France than it has in, uh, in North America. Uh, I'll let you read the lesson later, but the interesting question is, why is that the case? And of course, the assumption is, oh well, these technologies didn't work out quite the way we thought it would. But if you think about Monsanto as an example, though it's certainly not the only company in this field, Monsanto is obviously there trying to balance a number of different things. And what it has managed to do, I'm speculating, is to find that nice, that nice place where it can balance its its herbicide business with its seed business, right? And you all know, of course, in the process, it's used a patent system to essentially um, make servants of a whole lot of uh, farmers. In fact, one of my students last night, completely unprompted, said to me, well, my father's a, a, a farmer here in Canada, and he wouldn't dare not use some Monsanto seeds, because if he did, he might get sued if some of that seed turned up or some of that some of those plants turned up in his fields. He wouldn't even think about it. I've asked him about it, she said. Well, so um, Monsanto, of course, is, is terribly upset about this story, and there'll be a lot of discussion about it, and I don't know any better than anybody else does how it's going to come out. But I, I can well imagine that, that one of their arguments is, well, he's been taken up for a long time. They're very popular in the marketplace, but like, are they really popular if people don't have much of a choice? And who is it that makes it possible for Monsanto to do this? Well, one is the patent system, and the other is the army of lawyers it employs to go out and sue people if, in fact, they have any kind of, of GMO corn in, in their corn field. Okay, now I don't know much about the internals of, of Monsanto, but over my career, I did spend uh, at least four years at the companies I'm going to talk about now, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, I'll only just refer to a couple of them, but again, if you want to see the others, you may. Um, I, I want to talk about Alcoa because it was what really changed antitrust policy, and of course, antitrust and patent policy together are very important in, in their effect on innovation. Um, so I'm going to talk about Alcoa because it changed antitrust policy, um, and I'll say that briefly, and obviously it's very important from a legal perspective. But then the other two I'm going to talk about are RCA, and, uh, and Xerox, because those are companies, um, sorry, not Xerox, RCA and, um, no, R RCA and Xerox, sorry. <laughs> because both of those uh, laboratories, uh, one of which I worked for, Xerox Park, for quite a few years, um, were both named in, in the 1990s as part of the American Brain Trust. So they're very important laboratories in their own right, and, and I know something about the way decision making is done. So, Start with Alcoa. Uh, you probably know that there was a failed antitrust case in 1941 uh, where Alcoa won, but then the government imme immediately appealed it. And when they couldn't, when the government couldn't win against Alcoa because they had Alcoa had a huge army of very, very uh, expensive lawyers, um, it, and and the government had a, a very young group of lawyers in their antitrust division at that time. But they added on a whole bunch of them. They lost, but when they took it on appeal, they won because antitrust doctrine, doctrine was changed by Judge Roman in, in the economic outcomes theory. Uh, what that essentially meant was it doesn't matter whether you misuse your market power. If you have a very dominant position in the market, that means you are a monopolist. And that's the way it proceeded from that point on. So at that point, uh, the government stepped in and replaced the monopoly with an oligopoly. Al Alcoa was forced to license its new competitors with its latest technology. Now, the interesting and unexpected consequence of this, of course, was that Alcoa stopped doing fundamental research at a time when, as you say, fundamental research is actually considered very important, stopped patenting process developments, uh, and in the 1970s, 
put an immense amount of money into a new spelling process, which it was unable to complete because it didn't have the fundamental research base that it needed. Um, effect on technology, right? Uh, the ultimate effect was uh, it delayed significant improvement in the aluminum process technology until the 2000s. Um, here's another example, RCA. When RCA was forced to sign a consent decree, this of course against antitrust, and this continued its package licensing, meaning when you have when you, package licensing, it means that you you have all the whole set of patents in a in a package, and, and people either have to take all of them or none at all, and they have to pay for all of them or none at all. So that's of course very expensive, particularly for smaller companies. So that was that was eventually struck down. And, uh, and uh, RCA was required to sign a consent decree. Now, the interesting thing was that RCA originally thought that it was going to have to cut back on its research as a consequence. And then it realized it could still package license abroad. So it did package license abroad. Here's where your Japanese come in. Um, and uh, the outcome was that in just a few years, CEO David Sarnoff was given the highest honor ever given to a, to a non-Japanese. Order of the Rising Sun, second class, father of the Japanese electronics industry. RCA became a conglomerate again, advised to become a conglomerate because it wanted to grow, and conglomerates were the only kinds of mergers that were legally allowed at the time. But of course, uh, the unfortunate thing about conglomerates was that it seriously undercut a focused research effort because now you're no longer just an electronics company with various kinds of electronic, uh, both government and, uh, and consumer. Now you're also um, a random house, uh, banquet foods, uh, carpet company, on and on and on. So RCA uh, then moved to getting its returns on its technology, mainly and primarily through licensing. Huge returns from Japanese licensing but it, but it then made choices that, that emphasized the licensing aspects of the technology and thus made it harder and harder to produce the products it had produced with those technologies in-house. And the result was the book I wrote, the uh, uh, RCA video disc, which, which was a complete failure. And, uh, and all it didn't take down the company, it certainly helped. Um, a, a third example, briefly Xerox, where I worked for quite a while in, at part. Um, and, and in that case, Xerox lost its patent monopoly early uh, because AT&T and IBM pushed the Justice Department to sue uh, Xerox, and it ended the, the patent monopoly early. It immediately fired its army of patent lawyers and slimmed down to a staff that simply traded thousands of patents every year with Ken and some other Japanese uh, um, companies as well. Now, most of its large copiers continue to be produced in the U.S., but the entire retail business of small copiers and faxes went to Japan, especially because of the food Xerox, and again, there was a major, major loss of jobs. Xerox continued to do advanced research, and the fruits of computer research spread throughout Silicon Valley, but computer science itself, because computer science was in formation at that time. One of the differences I, I think there is between industrial research and university research, although you're correct that, that uh, the university was, was treated as a model in a sense, but the heyday of industrial research was actually when it was interdisciplinary. And computer science was still in a formative period in that early, in those early days. And, and it, it, as it became more of a regular science, right, uh, it began to lay out its guidelines, and one of them was to disregard emotion, affect, history, aesthetics, and so forth. We've been living with that one ever since. Okay, I won't do Corning at all here if you're interested. There's a little book. Um, but then I'm asking myself, where were the lawyers? Where was the legal system? Now, Paul, when it's case with an army of lawyers, I mentioned this before, uh, but when its industry became an oligopoly, it turns its attention and its best efforts to its Canadian holdings up here with Alcan. Alcoa, the same family owned both companies until through the 1950s, um, and a skirted antitrust law in the United States. 
uh, lawyers inside the company advised it to get its returns on technology by selling the technology before the new smelting process was operating. And from then on, because the new smelting process didn't work, it ended up uh, being more or less a commodity business. RCA under threat of RCA now under threat of antitrust promoted lawyers to senior executive positions and became a conglomerate, partly at their suggestion, maximizing short-term returns on technology, but making it impossible to achieve long-term innovation. Um, where the lawyers continued in, at, at Xerox, Xerox lawyers negotiated the first and longest strategic alliance with the Japanese. The actual deal had to be signed every 10 years. I was there for one of those. Um, and uh, in my experience, the lawyers consistently failed to tell us what it was all about in the laboratories. So, so we never really connected with the strategy ourselves. Here the scientists benefited, as you were saying, in maintaining funding and making choices in their own interest. But in fact, they were, they were encouraged not even to work on Xerox um, regular uh, products uh, for the whole first 10 years of the laboratory. Uh, so in fact, in that case, you would have said lawyers had very little to do with the choices that were made. In, in, in the technology was actually being promoted in the labs. Um, now, I look back at all this and I say, effectively antitrust and the anti antitrust prosecution, the fear of further antitrust <coughs> monitoring, placed lawyers in strategic decision-making positions inside corporations, basically from the 1950s on. Uh, in all these cases that I was talking about, lawyers were promoted and consulted on strategic decisions, including investments in commercialization of technology, because no antitrust cases were really closed. They continued to be monitored. By the 1960s, leading legal theorists embraced law and economics and transactional thinking, which really had its beginnings in antitrust. Um, I won't go into the professional communities here. I think, talk about the scientists, but I think the scientists and the lawyers were actually in sync for the first half of the 20th century. In fact, they started out being together in the 19th century. But their interests diverged, and they were both in, in competing for the, for the heart of the corporation uh, in the second half of the 20th century. Um, transactional thinking, this is uh, uh, one of our favorites, uh, Richard Posner, uh, who, uh, if you haven't read Richard Posner, he's well worth it, no matter whether you're a conservative or a liberal, he's really fascinating. Uh, calls himself a, a, a realist, right? Pragmatic realist, maybe even? Right. Pragmatist, fair enough. Uh, but he traces law, he read his primer on, on law and economics. He traces law and economics back to antitrust law in the 1930s, so he said he wasn't very sophisticated in those days, and he got much more sophisticated in the 1960s, he says, but of course it became the Chicago school. Uh, when economic outcomes and efficiency theory were replaced, Republican values, i.e. morality, precedent, subjective judgment, political and social good. Okay? All that gets boiled down to efficiency equals human welfare. Transactional thinking permeates legal training in corporate C-suites roughly from the 1970s on, I think it's fair to say. Uh, this is kind of in line with some of the other things we were talking about. You didn't mention this part of it, but American Bar actually enlisted, um, or I, I worded that badly. The American Bar was enlisted to advise on strategy to dispel the evils of uncertainty, quote unquote. Um, and they were, they were encouraged to give advice on competition uh, and, and, and to encourage CEOs uh, to, to be careful how they handle themselves and what choices they made with antitrust in mind. So, but nothing other than this efficiency argument was really going to be acceptable from this point on. So the Supreme Court ruled against, for instance, General Motors' request for antitrust exemption for a search on safety. Uh, it sent a clear message, of course. Uh, Professor Donald Turner at Harvard, uh, who wrote extensively on antitrust, uh, argued that no political or social good arguments could be tolerated. Uh, he ruled out all defenses based on social and political goals and, and said efficiency arguments, as in the, the highest good and the highest human value, uh, would be accepted. 
costs much easier to measure the benefits, uh, which are further away and more uncertain, so you get the shorter and shorter term horizon as you try to figure out when, when you already know pretty much what costs are going to be, how you could possibly measure benefits. Efficiency doctrine becomes the only safe defense strategy. Um, and when combining the IDAs with the shareholder value arguments and a change to CEO compensation, stock, and options, uh, you, you, you probably know what happened. Uh, companies had increasingly withdrawn from making those kinds of big bets and long term bets. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, as you say, it's shifted more to universities. So there's an evolution of antitrust policy that I won't go through here, but uh, at this time, but you can see it's there. And let's go back to GMOs, Monsanto, et al. And, and I guess my argument is it's really not technical. I'm guessing it's not a technical problem, although certainly some of the resistance that's developed and that kind of thing uh, may well be not totally anticipated. Nevertheless, I'm convinced that it's more likely to be strategic issues and business concerns that are shaping the net GMO technology in Monsanto and in DuPont Dow and these other companies, all of which are trying to merge now. Because of course, if I went through antitrust policy and it shifts, you would you would see that when when at first the only place that the antitrust was or the only place that mergers were allowed was really if you were going to achieve conglomerates. In the 1980s, we started to allow more and more um, mergers and acquisitions because we were we competing globally, right? And so when you when you allow more and more mergers and acquisitions, companies start saying, why are we investing all this money in long-term uncertain kind of research when well, we can just go out and buy something we already know we can get, right? So that's what's been happening after the last 20 years at least. Um, so it's not the technology that forces change on society, it's the choices corporations make while the technology is under development. Uh, companies employ armies of lawyers to enforce patent rights. Many others pass through the revolving door from government to private practice, lobbying, trade negotiation, secret except for lobbyists so as not to be politicized, which would be wrong, according to the supposed. Uh, regulatory regimes recognize that major holes, but they aren't fixed. So will Monsanto and others ever be accountable for, the cho for their choices, the choices they made which have shaped GMO technology? I say not likely. They are now the mainstay of the UN Millennium Development Goals, uh, Goal 8 specifically, corporate partnerships. Uh, their goal to industrialize agriculture globally. So that's where radical transactionalism comes in. Okay. This phrase used the recent issue of the economy to describe free trade deals between North America and Europe, as of all in the news of late. We just signed one of them. What's the effect on the, where are the effects on the legal system? Where are the lawyers? Well, if you think about it, and you think what must be happening in the EU, I heard a Monsanto person interviewed this morning and said, well, I fully expect that uh, GMOs will be accepted soon in the EU. Well, one reason if they are accepted will be because of these free trade deals. The new free trade deals negotiated by lawyers. In the U.S., they hail from the Department of Commerce, from Trade and Industry, from the State Department, and from various regulatory agencies. <laughs> the arbitration mechanisms to be staffed by lawyers with similar experience but not to be tried in courts. So how long will the prohibition on GMOs last in the EU? Regardless of health benefits displayed by conventional agriculture, as this study has just showed, does civil law matter here? I don't know. I think it's very desirable. People do both civil and and uh, common law, right? And I would be interested to know whether civil law has something to do with, with this rejection of uh, GMOs to this point. To conclude, what I consider a realistic view of technology, and this is my non-lawyer's point of view, uh, the missing link is the corporation when we understand how technology is developed. They aren't developed by industries, they're developed by companies drawing equally on university or startup research. Lawyers like engineers have been servants of corporations in the 19th century when they declared intellectual property corporate by default. If you don't know that book, Catherine Fisk, Working Knowledge, I think it's a wonderful book. Um, lawyers need the corporation, as do other professional groups, to maintain steady flows of financial support. 
the hip corporation, the firepower to defend itself against accountability, defend against accountability. The corporation has the money to defend itself. Is the corporation the main locus of innovation anymore? Not according to authorities like Block and Nutella. I'd be glad to supply you with that reference. But as entrepreneurial startups are monetized from the beginning, they too will end up corporate either directly or indirectly. The goal of many startups, the origin of much modern technology, is the IPO followed by sale or outright sale to start this now, knowing this small companies too make their choices and their compromises. Thank you.